Let's get ready to rumble! Senior Nation jam-packed show today. Peloton of 5%. What's up, Discipline Investor? We have Benzinga CEO Jason Raznick here with us. The man, the myth, the legend, Tom Nash. Peter Schiff on the Power Hour with us live today. Interesting, different, unique, innovative companies. Mia, you are live with us on the Power Hour. What's up? Thank you so much for inviting me on. Jessica Billingley is the CEO of Aperna. The best trade idea resource out there. Yo, what's going on, guys? Happy Friday. Woo! We are back at it, ready to rock and roll into to another end of the trading week, a short trading week. Uh, and, and I actually have, have my favorite guest, favorite guest of the show, uh, is going to be joining us. So if there's any other guests out there watching, sorry, you are second favorite, which is still a high position. He's, he's looking big today. He said he's feeling big today. Let, let's bring him on. Jonah Lufton. What's going on, man? How are you doing today, sir? That is hands down the best intro I've ever gotten. So boom. Okay. You, All you right. just made my day. <laughs> so 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 what what's going on, man? How how, how is like, it? How do you like my you? shirt? You like that? Yes, sir. Did, did they send it to you? No, I bought it. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. They Fair have enough. uh they they have one of those custom ink stores where you know, like they create it and then you can go in there and buy it. And it was like 20 bucks. I mean, I've made I've made so much money on Upstart this year that 20 bucks. I, I probably should have bought more and given them out to all my friends. Yeah. So, so you made enough money to, to to pay for the shirt and all the money you saved on commissions. You weren't saving yeah. that money years yep. ago that more than paid for the shirt. So, <laughs> all right. so how, Cel- how is Celsius doing for you? Good, man. You know, what? I, I, I have a good story for you, too. Uh, my mom, I was talking to my mom this weekend. She came over for dinner, uh, and, and I was drinking a Celsius. Um, and she said that, that she had tried one in the previous week. And that was the first energy drink that my mother who, who's in her sixties has consumed in her entire life in her wow. 60 years on earth. That was the one, um, you know, is she it, liked it, it? Yeah. Yes, she, she did. Is, is it going to be an everyday thing for her? No. No, but, but that was like the most bullish signal I've gotten. I'm like, okay, this woman who's never had an energy drink in her life, somebody gave this to her and she drank it and enjoyed it. And I'm like, okay, we're, we're getting some market penetration here. I mean, the, the cult is getting bigger, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm even though I love the product, I mean, I also love the stock because the data backs it up. If you look at the numbers coming out of Nielsen and Stackline, it's insane. I mean, this company is literally growing 200% year over year in retail stores. Shelves are empty because the DSD partners can't keep up. Like that's the problem with DSD. I mean, it doesn't even matter. You can't do distribution effectively if you have companies delivering multiple products to stores, but most of those products are growing at 10 or 20% year over year. And then you have one product growing at 200% year over year. Like they would have to go to the stores way more often in order to keep those Celsius shelves stocked. So okay, wait, 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 wait. So, so, so let me make sure I understand that problem. Right. It, it, it's basically that, that the product is sell, like, like the, the, the change in the, the sales, right. Sort of like the acceleration of the sales is is too fast that the distributors aren't able to respond to it and keep product on shelves. Yeah, because I mean, that, they, they have, yeah, they have their roots. They're going to go to stores on a you know every two days, every three days, every four days, whatever it is. But if you have one product that's selling so freaking fast, you're not going to change your entire route to go to that you know to go to a store more often just to keep that one product stocked. So unfortunately, like it's it's a good problem to have. I mean, Celsius is just growing so fast right now that the DSD partners cannot keep up with it. Yep. Now, you know, it'll eventually work itself out, I assume, because what's going to happen is the stores will allocate more shelf space to Celsius so that when the DSD partners are there, they can stock more at a time, right? Like if you only had five rows of Celsius before, maybe yep. the store expands it to 10 rows so that those DST partners can put in twice as many cans when they're there every three days. So that's and, what's going to happen. They'll, they'll eventually just keep on gobbling up more and more shelf space. And, and and let me ask you this, because I would imagine that that would be a change that happens relatively quickly. Is that the case or, or not necessarily? So I've been told that a lot of these stores do their like planograms or whatever it's called towards the end of the year. 
So what will happen is over the next couple of months, these stores will decide how much how much more shelf space they want to give to Celsius going into 2022. Okay, so that's a catalyst that we have to watch out for then. Absolutely. And, and Canada, you know, I think we'll get into Canada at some point in the next year. That could be another catalyst as well. So, oh yeah, I mean, I'm still and, super and, bullish. And, and what 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 are the big stores that we're waiting on right now? Like like if I go to a Speedway here in here in Detroit, Michigan, there, there there's no Celsius there. So I don't know if that's a national thing or or what the deal is. Yeah, I mean, so they should be in Speedways, they should be in 7-Elevens, they should be in Walmart's, Targets, Kroger's, like all of those stores have have authorized it on a national level. But some of these stores, like until you get to that annual like planogram, you know, reset, um, they may not have the shelf space right now, but it's coming. Like, you know, so so that's the, the so when you hear that a hundred a hundred thousand stores have been authorized to carry Celsius, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that all a hundred thousand stores are carrying it yet. But they will in the near future as soon as they do these resets for shelf space. Got it. Okay. All right. So, so that's what we're waiting on. Yep. Um, and, and, and then we had a, a nice price target come out today. It was Roth 100. Capital, hundred dollars, baby. First one. So that was the first. Okay. Uh, they, they kept so. their buy rating. Let's, let's, let's go to our trusty Benzinger pro. What, <laughs> what did it come from? So it went from 85 up to a hundred. All right. That, 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 that's a nice little jump there. Uh, do, do you have a price in your mind or, or, um, or I mean, is it I, a wait and see? I mean, I've been saying for the last four or five months, I thought that we could get to 100 by year end. Um, but I also didn't think that we were going to see 218% year over year revenue, you know, sales data for the first two months of August. So, you know, if, if they continue accelerating revenues and we, we go, so my, my revenue target for the year was 285 million. But if they can blow past that, then I think yeah. we can get past we can get past hundred dollars a share. Um, so it, it's I don't really have like I I think this could be a hundred and eighty dollar stock by the end of next year. So that's kind of what I'm focused on right now is you know what can this stock do over the next twelve to eighteen months? Um, you know as those hundred thousand stores start to put it on the shelves as the company continues putting these branded coolers into their you know, their, their top or, you know, the sales velocity locations. So for instance, like Speedway, right? Speedway, 7-Eleven, you know, these are considered like grab and go spots where someone wants to walk in and grab a cold beverage out of a cooler because they're going to drink it right then and there. It doesn't help to have Celsius on the shelf at Speedway because nobody wants okay. a warm energy drink. Yep. So you're going to see these branded coolers going into the Speedways, going into 7-Elevens, going into the CVSs and the pharmacies and whatnot, and maybe even the grocery stores as well. So that's that's the big catalyst. Right now, they have about 500 of those coolers, you know, uh, in stores. But hopefully, by the end of next year, that number could triple or quadruple from there. And 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 like I don't understand the, this business as well as you do. do. Does Celsius have to pay for those coolers to get them in the stores? Like, do they have to pay a rental to to the store to keep those coolers there, or, believe, or do the stores like it just because it helps sell? Or what, how does that work? I believe Celsius actually picks up the tab for the cooler. Okay. Uh, because they've talked about on the earnings call, like the, well, yeah. the like, but, but like, do they pay rentals to the store? Like, hey, we want this space in your store, so I don't we're going so. to remit some money to you. I haven't heard them talk about that. I've heard them say that the the payback on the coolers is like three or four months. Okay. Meaning that you know having that cooler in the store in a key location uh, increases the sales velocity so much over what it would have been without the cooler that you know, that extra sales velocity coming out of that store pays for the cooler within three or four months. I don't think Celsius has to pay for space on top of it. I don't Got think, it. Okay. I, I've never heard them talk about that. Okay. Um, all right. So, so I had two things I wanted to make sure we talked about. Celsius was absolutely one. Uh, the other one, your event. Yep. You, you, it, you, you have a very exciting event coming up. Yep. So down in Florida. Florida. Yeah. Tell us about we're, it. We're calling it the FinTwit Conference because uh, that's sort of why we're doing it is so that people on FinTwit that talk about stocks all day can finally get a chance to meet each other in real life, you know, rather than just uh, over Twitter. So a few months ago, I, I kind of came up with the idea. I talked to a few people. Everyone seemed pretty excited about it. 
we were still in a pandemic, but it looked like we were getting closer to the end, you know, with more people getting vaccinated. So, yep, that's the website. So FinTwit 2021 is the website. And I just dropped it in the chat, guys. Okay, cool. So you can go there, get all the information. So you can see the schedule, the speakers, the sponsors. We have links to the hotel. And hotels. the pool. Don't, don't short sell the pool, okay? The pool's, I mean, the pool's gorgeous. And there's a lazy yeah. river that goes around it as well. Okay, all right. So so you, me, and the rest of the gang watching this are going to get in some tubes and we're going to yeah. float around the, the lazy river. All with right. our drinks, with our margaritas or daiquiris or whatever it might be. Because there's actually uh, there's actually a couple bars out there as well. So you, know, right. you can... You can get your adult beverages if you want. So we're going to do this. So it's Columbus Day weekend, which is October 8th through the 10th. Uh, the Monday is a holiday, so the markets are closed. So that's one reason we wanted to do it, since it's obviously a lot of investors and traders. This way, they don't have to miss uh, a day of making money. So a lot of people are going to fly in on that Friday. We're going to do a cocktail party outside in the Citrus Garden. Benzinga is going to be down there doing some interviews, taking pictures, et cetera. Uh, we'll have cash bars, um, you know, and it'll just be just a networking opportunity for people to start to get to know each other. And then Saturday morning, we'll be in the ballroom inside. Uh, if, you know, it is, there is a possibility that if COVID gets worse, we might move some of that stuff outside. But for now, we're going to do it in the ballroom. Uh, we're going to have testing kits available. We're going to have masks available. So if you, Want to get tested? You know, we're we're covering that expense out of That's our own awesome. pockets. Uh, we'll really have cool. we'll have different types of masks. You know, medical mask, and then we'll have N95 masks. So if you're concerned, you know, we're going to take every precaution we possibly can. We're not going to require vaccinations. We're obviously recommending people get vaccinated if they're going to be traveling to this event. Um, so we'll start off, and then Saturday morning we're going to do the breakfast buffet in the ballroom. And then we're going to do four hours of speakers. So it'll be a keynote. It'll be breakout sessions. It'll be panels. And then we'll wrap up with a another buffet lunch. And then after lunch, we'll go out to the pool. And we'll hang out at the pool for a few hours. And then we'll go grab dinner. And then after dinner, we're going to go to some nightclub and you know have a big VIP party there. And then Sunday morning, we'll be back out in the Citrus Garden. And we're going to do a round table event. So we'll have 15 or 20 different tables set up. We'll have a different topic or conversation happening at each table you know maybe one table we're talking about option strategies another table we're talking about you know dark pools another table we're talking about crypto and that way you can just kind of bounce around from table to table and, and pop in on different discussions and then after the round table event you know people they can go to the pool grab lunch go to the gym and then we'll meet up again around 12 30 and we'll head over to a local sports bar and watch some of the nfl games and I think we're going to have like free pizza and beer at the uh, at the sports uh, sports bar. Lions Vikings October tenth. That's my game. Okay. Wait, which are you a big fan of one of those teams? Oh, I'm a crazy Lions fan. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not. I'm not saying it's a good team to be a fan of, but but that is absolutely my team. My best friend from college grew up as a Lions fan because his dad is from Detroit, so he was just kind of bred that way. I mean, he lives in New Hampshire now. He's never lived in Detroit. I think he's only been there once or twice in his life, but he's a diehard Lions fan. Like, he's got banners all over his house. So I, I feel your pain, man. I feel your pain. Yeah, we we, <laughs> we have a great punter, the best punter in the league, plenty of practice. Wait, who's your – you guys got rid of Stafford. Who's the quarterback now? Goff. We have Goff. This oh, year. yeah, you did, like, the switcheroo with the we Rams. Did, yeah, we did the switcheroo and picked up a couple uh, a couple picks. So Okay. How does everyone feel about how, how like how does Detroit fans feel about that? Uh, g- good, surprisingly, um, because we had Stafford for a very long time. On I mean, and you didn't. I mean, he's a good quarterback, but he didn't a, win anything with him. Exactly. That that's the sentiment. He's a great quarterback, and he had a shitty team, a shitty right. you know environment to be in, and and so the general sentiment is Detroit is we are okay with him going somewhere for a few years to try to take a shot at, at winning something. Well, that was my problem. I mean, growing up, my favorite football player was Barry Sanders, but he was always okay. on a crappy team. Yes. Um, yes. You know, you feel bad for these guys. Like I just feel bad that he never had a chance to win a Super Bowl because he was always surrounded by a bunch of bozos. So yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, all right. One more lion set for you. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm about to be turning 30 and the lions have not won a playoff game. In my lifetime, in my entire lifetime, not won a single playoff game. They have not won a wild card game. None of that. I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but you might need to find a new team. (laughs) 
<laughs> come on, dude, come on to the Patriots bandwagon. We got a new quarterback. He's going to be our our new uh, our, our our new. He's going to start a new dynasty in New England. Okay. Uh, we still got Belichick. Um, I'm just kidding. I know everyone hates the Patriots. Okay. So, and then one last thing. So with the conference, so you can see where it says reserve hotel. So we have rooms blocked off at the JW Marriott and the Ritz Carlton. Uh, both hotels are right next to each other. Awesome. They share the same amenities and we got a amazing price of two thirty nine a night. So right now, if you went to those hotels and tried to book them off of their websites, the JW Marriott's going for over 400 a night. And the Ritz is going for over 600 a night, and we got them blocked off for 239. Um, however, Amazing. that room block is only good for another week. So that room okay. block ends on September 17th. All right. So so producer AB was kept bugging me to book the rooms, and now I understand why. Okay, we, yeah. we need to yep. do it now. Yeah, I mean, tech technically the hotel might let us go a little bit longer, but it's gonna base be based on availability at the hotel. So technically our room block falls off on the 17th. And then after that, you might get the 239 price, but only if there's room still left. Um, and I, I can't guarantee that. So I'm telling everyone to book, you know, book in the next week. So you're guaranteed that 239 price. And then the event tickets are 175 a person, but that includes, you know, all of your food on Saturday. Uh, and then I mean, that's nothing for, yeah. for what you get. The hangout, and, the, the education, the people. Yeah, for meet. sure. Yep. Nothing. So I was, I was talking to my Atlas boys too, Hugh Honey. Yeah, he'll day. be there. He'll be there. He's yep. fired up for it. Yeah, so. he's one of the speakers. We got uh, Brian Shannon, um, Jake from Trend Spider, Richard. Yep, there you go. Uh, what's really cool is Muji and Peter, who are like the two, you know, uh, kind of cloud stock, cybersecurity, software gurus on Twitter. We're going to do a panel with the two of them on stage together. So that alone is worth the price of admission. Yeah, that's amazing. All right, guys. The message is be there, be square. I'm going to be there. Producer AB is going to be there. He's What's up, definitely... John? How are we doing? Good, man. I appreciate you guys uh, helping out with this. Yeah, of course. Of course. I'm excited for it. Should yeah, be a good time. It's a sweet event. It, it, it's like a, a, a good mission that you're driving it with. Of We've all been locked down for a year and a half. We see all these names on Twitter and on the internet every day. Like, let's just go party and, and try to learn some stuff together. Exactly. I mean, I haven't been on an airplane in two years. Um, and even though the last year has sort of felt like a vacation <laughs> in a way, because <laughs> I haven't been to an office, uh, it'll be nice to get down there and, and see some familiar faces. And you know, I just think, you know, this is how you build friendships. This is how you build relationships over time. You know, not, not just tweeting at each other all day, but actually getting together you know, having a drink together, sitting around the pool, telling some stories. So um, I'm pretty pumped. And like I said, I mean, we're going to have test kits down there. We're going to have masks. So if you're at all nervous, you know, get vaccinated, come down and, and we'll do do what we can to protect people. Oh, yeah. All right. And Jonah, one last question. And I'll let you go. Uh, are, are we going to hit the gym together down there? Yeah. So you're looking think, strong today. I do it. I feel strong. Maybe it's just this upstart shirt. But it's the it's upstart shirt. The or triple Celsius. XL upstart. So I actually made a bet with a couple of people on Twitter that as soon as Celsius closes above 90, I have to, sh you know, uh, make a video of me shotgunning a Celsius. And it looks like that might be today. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's price check it. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. It, it's it's going to be today. I don't know if it's giving up <laughs> two bucks in the next three hours. Um. And well, oh, so and I'm actually trying to get Celsius uh, to not sponsor the event, but to provide some free drinks for us. And the since the headquarters of Celsius is in Boca Raton, which is not that far away, there's a chance that the CEO is actually going to come to the event and he's going to bring a ton of cases with him that we can hand out uh, as people are leaving the event, um, like leaving the event space on Saturday. Uh, the hotel doesn't the hotel doesn't want us giving them out to people before the event because yep. if they if they drink them in the ballroom, they have to charge me three dollars a can as like okay. a surcharge. So what, as okay. people are leaving the ballroom, uh, yeah. But if you can get a case of Celsius on the way out, it take it all day. I don't know if we're gonna give a case to everybody. Right. If you get a drink on the way out, you'll be double fisting on the way out. I promise that. 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I, I'll need to bring one home for my mom so she can have her second Celsius. And not not that we can endorse Celsius and alcohol, but I have a feeling that some people are going to try to mix the two together at the pool party, which is fine. I mean, just be careful because there is there is some caffeine in those. Um, but I'm I'm curious to see what that what happens with uh, a, little bit, a little bit of Celsius and a little bit of uh, hard liquor together. Should be a nice combination. I'll go. I'll go out on a limb. I'll be the guinea pig there, down in down in uh, Orlando. So <laughs> I know you well, will. So Celsius has a really good cola flavor, and I'm curious to see what that cola flavor tastes like with maybe some Captain Morgan. Uh, probably not not too shabby. All right, that, that'll all right. That'll be my first one. That'll be my go-to. But yes, but Luke, well, uh, I think I think Sunday after we finish up the round table before we go to the sports bar, I think that's when we're going to try to squeeze in a gym session together. All right, I'm down. Guys, be there or be squared. Jonah, appreciate you taking the time out of your day to hop on with us. Appreciate you putting on this event. I am excited for the Lazy River. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Have a good weekend, guys. All right, take care, man. Yeah. Thank you, Jonah. All right, producer AB, this is the vacation we've been waiting for. I'm pumped. I'm absolutely pumped. <laughs> yep. So, all right. I, I know you got Tim Quas queued up. Yes. Another amazing guest to be bringing on to the show. We have a packed power hour this Friday. If you're just joining us, don't go anywhere. We have guests lined up the whole show. But yes, Luke, without further ado, let's go ahead and get over to my man, Tim Quast. Tim, how's it going? Well, thank you. Just uh, by the way, a plug for the for the event that Jonah was was talking about there. I, I don't know all the details of the event, but I know the JW Marriott and the Ritz Carlton there in Orlando pretty well. I have floated that lazy river numerous times, and uh, there is a great bar in that Ritz Carlton called Highball and Harvest. And uh, I have I have been there into the wee hours with people in my profession uh, because that's that's you know, that's what we do. So uh, it's a great place to go. If you're if you're uncertain, I'll tell you, it's a beautiful property. And they are okay. adding that to my list of places to go while I'm down there. The bar at Ritz Carlton uh, sounds fun. I, I wish I would have been there at some of those times you were there till, till the wee hours. I'm sure those are some, some great conversations. Yes, indeed. Well, you know, we, we when we're talking about market structure, however, the room clears. So then there are only three of us. Uh, but uh, we thought it was fun. So when you say in your profession, it ends up getting whittled down to a very small group. It does. Yeah. So so the the event at which I have visited those facilities is the annual conference for the Association for Investor Relations Professionals, which is called NERI. It's, it, it nearly stands for National Investor Relations Institute. I've been a member for 26 years, but that's the association of folks at public companies who are responsible for the relationships with Wall Street. So with the, the analysts who write coverage, uh, the investors who buy and sell shares. And you know, we, we're in the middle providing data so that public companies can understand uh, what's occurring, you know, what causes shareholder value to go up or down. And that's the thing. So the, the annual confab of that event is, is uh, what took me there. I, and uh, I was the vice chair of the last eight of one of two vice chairs of the last in per big event in uh, 2019. And I, I held a panel with Lee Cooperman from Omega Advisors, uh, Brett Redfern at the time, the, uh, the head of the Division of Trading and Markets at the SEC, Joe Saluzzi, one of the great market structure experts uh, in the country. He's been on 60 Minutes. Brett Redfern was just at Coinbase, head of uh, capital markets, but he left. And it was the thing that made me say, hmm, <laughs> I, if, if, a, if a fellow like Brett Redfern uh, leaves Coinbase, then I'm going to have a look at that. You know, it's, it's, uh, he's a high quality character, a, a guy of great character and a, a, a very smart individual uh, who understands the markets. He was the head of market structure for J.P. Morgan. Uh, before joining the SEC, so there's a bunch of stuff that it won't help won't help your trading community, but it's interesting to know. 
it's fun. Yeah, we, we like to have fun on Power Hour. Um, but yeah, Tim, let's go ahead and get to some some tickers from the chat. Maybe check them out on Market Structure sure. Edge. Um, yeah. We do only have you know a few minutes today, but rest yeah. assured, if you, if you came here for Tim, if you came here to check out Market Structure Edge, Tim will be back on with us next week for hopefully a more extensive um, appearance. Um, let me know when you got your, your screen shared and I'll go ahead and pop it up on the screen. And while you do that, let me do this too. I'm going to, um, uh, and by the way, this AB and I are doing this wholly unscripted. We, I was driving down from Steamboat Springs. I arrived here mere moments ago. I'm in Denver now. And uh, so, so we had no time to plan what we, you know, we didn't, didn't even trade talking points. So I will put a plug in for the Benzinga boot camp, which is tomorrow. Everybody say a prayer. Uh, recognizing the 20 year anniversary of 9-11 and uh, we'll mark it with some good education. Uh, but I'm gonna be there at noon Eastern time, uh, 30 minutes and, and I'll talk about how to use the supply and demand of the market to beat buy and hold. And it might sound sacrilegious, it's not at all. We, have, it, the, we can't cling tra to tradition. We need to make sure that the data reflect the best courses of action and I'll, I'll talk about that. So. Uh, maybe a good lead in, A.B., for a minute here is to talk about where the broad market is. And this, I think this is one of the most important things for traders to understand. And it's, it's, uh, it's underappreciated um, in the trading community. You know, there's certainly people who get it. But options expire next week. And conventionally, there are always exceptions to the rule. Uh, the, the, when the market has risen ahead of expirations, this, by the way, is SPY. So, you know, we've had a, had a little bit of retreat. And yet, if you looked at the underlying components of the S&P 500, they were up six tenths of a percent a week ago and down about seven tenths of a percent the last five trading days. So it's about level if you look at the composition. Uh, notice that brought, this is our measure of supply and demand. So uh, when this, this measure is right, we, it's, we call this market structure sentiment. Here it's broad sentiment. Uh, and this is our risk management tool. It's a great way to understand the short term waxing and waning of supply and demand. And so when the market peaks ahead of expirations, it can mean that the market will decline into them. Not always, but oftentimes. And why is that? Well, it's because if, if uh, the use of leverage, the use of calls or swaps by hedge funds uh, have worked, then you, you, you stop that strategy and you, you reevaluate it into options expirations. Uh, index funds are heavy users of futures and options to true up their tracking. We used to have on our client services team, a former uh, portfolio manager at BNY Mellon, and his whole job was to trade futures contracts to eliminate tracking errors because that's what index funds want. So people don't think about that. You can't just look at the options and futures market and conclude that it's telling you something about what rational people think is correct about the market or the value of individual stocks. The great bulk of those are used for truing up tracking and for speculative purposes where the end itself is the change in price of the option. So keep that in mind. And that's coming next week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, so we start with VIX expirations, then index options expirations, then quad witching. When, but when options and futures on indexes and stocks alike, their single stock futures contracts, uh, futures and options, sorry, expire. So it's a bigger deal. Uh, the S&P indexes rebalance. There are other in NASDAQ indexes may rebalance then. There are 3 million global index products. Way, 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 way more products like that than there are stocks. So. Now, AB, what should we look at? Well, I, I, so before we get to some tickers from the chat, let us know in the chat kind of what tickers you want us to check out on Market Structure Edge. Is this something that you recommend, um, you know, people that use Market Structure Edge do just go in and check in on like the broad sentiment of, of the market while you're trading? It's easy step number five. We say, number one, understand your dashboard. Know what the market is doing. You can see all of the trend lines in the market. Uh, by sector, what the fangs are doing. Uh, then you want to know how to create portfolios so you can track groups, then learn entries and exits. Fourth, back test your data. Always back test what you're going to do. You want the math on your side. And number five, yes, manage overall risk. I don't care how good a stock is. Uh, if the broad market, the, the money that is moving in large swaths, the macroeconomic money, and it's much, much larger than URI trading stocks. 
uh, it has decided that it's going to shift from this kind of thing to this kind of thing, you will be overrun. So you have to be aware of those things so that doesn't happen to you. Personally, I like to take my money out of the market and walk around, do a portage <laughs> around options expirations, and then re-enter the stream. Why? Because if you look through year to date in, the, in, in trading uh, and you add up, the, what has happened around options expirations, there have been eight dates so far, ninth coming up. The market has declined more than 25% at those points. Add them up. Well, what if we just skip those? Well, then we don't have to recover the 25 points that we've lost. We can just start where we are. Well, that's vastly superior. And nobody talks about it. Why? I don't know. We've been talking about it for more than a decade. We tell public companies, don't report earnings during options expirations. It's like trying to give a speech over a leaf blower. You want to communicate important information to your investors, and the market is being priced by index rebalances, people adjusting their risk uh, management schemes, uh, speculative strategies, uh, lapsing and renewing, all of that's occurring. Well, why would you confuse outcomes with that? And the same applies to you traders. If you're betting through that, you may be overrun as you're roller skating by, by a buffalo herd. And as we know, you know, Roger Miller said, don't roller skate in a buffalo herd. That's a little humor for old people like me. So yes, we tell people to watch that. That makes a lot of sense when you explain it like that, Tim. All right, well, we only got a couple minutes, so let's go. Um, I know you were gonna you get you have Tesla pulled up. That's always a favorite of the chat. And then after that, we got Bill uh, Stangler asking about Apple. So we'll do Tesla Apple. Bill. And okay, right, good, Bill. I appreciate that. So quick, quick, very short comment here on Tesla. You know, you want to buy Tesla when the sentiment is rising, when demand is increasing. So what we're looking at, I could go, you know, here's short volume. If the supply side is falling and the demand side is rising, price increases. It's very simple. It's the most simple economic principle. And most of the time, if you buy rising sentiment and as soon as sentiment stops rising and begins to fall, you leave and you come back when that repeats. It doesn't matter where the price is. What difference does it make what the price of Tesla is? What matters is the supply demand equation and producing a gain because we want to take gains and not chances. And if you follow that religiously, most of the time, not all of the time, most of the time, it will produce returns. The exceptions may be around month end when people rebalance and around options expirations. But this is, and you can see it, each time there's a peak, these are points where Tesla has done better and it's in one now. So, let, so you, if you're in Tesla, be aware of that. The supply side looks fine, but the demand side is just about as long as those demand sides tend to run. So if I were in Tesla, I'm not at the moment, I would take my money off the table ahead of options expirations. Okay, Bill, let's go look at Apple. And the principle, by the way, if this is brand new to you, uh, we use quantitative mathematics and algorithms predicated on the rules that govern how stocks have to trade. There are a set of rules. Uh, you were talking about uh, NFL. You know, so that there are rules that govern what you can and can't do. Your, 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 uh, uh, your configuration at the line. I, I played quarterback in high school. I, I had to know what all the holes are and what everybody's doing and what the coverage patterns are. Uh, so there are rules. There are things you can and cannot do. Same thing applies to trading. Well, that lends itself very well to modeling the math of the market. So here's Apple. We've had a very, Apple has been great. You know, it's a five most of the time, meaning that the demand and supply equations are very good. So it tends to do better when the supply side is weak. So if short volume drops, Apple rises. Short volume drops, Apple rises. Where is it now? Well, demand's pretty good, but look at that supply side. Short volume is rising. Well, that's into options expirations. That's going to put pressure on Apple. Is it going to be bad? Probably not. But you can see it. If you see that this rises above the trend line and you know that the broad market sentiment is peaked, it's a good time to leave. I have a little Apple, too. I wish I, I was talking about this yesterday uh, with Neil Hamilton. And I said, or it was Wednesday. Maybe it was Wednesday. I said, time to leave Apple. <laughs> And, and, they did, and it was, right? It's time to leave Apple. That's how to use supply and demand to your advantage. So come join me at noon Eastern time at the boot camp uh, tomorrow, and uh, we'll explain it with some background, some of the, the rules and facts about what the 
data show about how the market performs. Beautiful. Yeah. And I got uh, Aaron Bryan in the chat. Another AB was saying hey. it, it would be amazing to have this data for the crypto market. I'm sure at some point, um, you know, maybe eventually on Market Structure Edge, we'll be able to see some of that market sentiment on the crypto market as well. Um, you can, in answer to that, you can create a crypto proxy using equities. I, I illustrated this with Bitcoin on Monday or Tuesday, I guess it was this week, uh, on Market Structure or uh, Market Structure Tuesday <laughs> instead of Monday. And, and it tells us to be very cautious about, about, about cryptocurrencies right now. If you look at that data, the, the issue with uh, tracking cryptocurrency data is there isn't a regulation national market system regulating that market, which is awesome. It'll be human fear and greed but it doesn't lend itself well to math because it's very difficult to accurately model human fear and greed. We can model compliance with rules. Uh, that is wholly mathematical and that's why this works. But yes, at some point it'll happen. Beautiful. All right, Tim. Well, thank you for hopping on the Power Hour today. I know we had a little Good bit shorter you. time than we normally do, but next week we'll get you on, um, obviously, Market Structure Monday, then get technical as well as Power Hour. So there will be no shortage of supply of Tim Quast on Ben <laughs> week. There, there, there may be an oversupply. Good to see you. Thank you, AB. Catch you. Of course. Enjoy your weekend, Tim. All right, y'all. That was Tim Quast of Market Structure Edge. I'm going to drop the link in the chat if you want to go sign up for a free two-week free trial. Um, and then, as I said, we've got a packed show today, so we're going to go ahead and keep it running. Let me get my Benzinga Pro pulled up. And uh, joining us in a few moments will be the CEO of um, Mama Mancini Security, ticker MMMB. Uh, company had some news come out this week, so very excited to get Carl on the show. See if he's ready. Give me the universal sign of a, of a thumbs yeah. up, and I'll go ahead and bring him on the show. All right, let's go ahead and do it. Carl, how's it going? Good, very good. Just Thanks. learned a little. Learned a little. I know that it's so it's so much to learn from Tim. He has so much knowledge that it's it's hard to pick up all of it sometimes. <laughs> Talks fast too. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Carl, thank you for taking time out of your busy Friday to join us on the Benzinga Power Hour. Um, just real quick before we begin, can you go ahead and give a brief overview of uh, Mama Mancini for maybe some of our our viewers that may not be familiar? Yes. Uh, we make a whole line of high quality, all natural Italian foods uh, led by our meat. And we have 29 products. And then we have uh, different SKUs uh, that also are on QVC. So a total of about with the same products, but just different uh, format. So a total of around 50 uh, different products. Um, what's uh, driving the business right now is uh, pasta bowls. Um, and we, sh we ship mainly to supermarkets uh, and club stores, and we ship uh, the, I think of um, Hello Fresh. Uh, we ship the product in uh, separate bags, frozen, the supermarket uh, defrost it, and then they uh, layer it and uh, put it out and grab and go. So that has been a very big driver of our business right now. Beautiful. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know who doesn't love Italian food and some meatballs. So probably some customers in the, in the audience right now. Um, so I do see that Mama Mancini secured a uh, $10.5 million in expanded credit facility. That's why, correct. Why, why is this important to the company? Well, the company is on an acquisition search. And uh, my early career was in acquisitions and mergers and uh, strategic uh, planning or strategic options. So um, we hired an outside consultant to help us, and we've been reviewing uh, companies to purchase. Um, um, hopefully, we're near uh, our first deal. Uh, we'll know uh, shortly. Uh, and um, we have a pretty demanding uh, uh, criteria for purchasing. It has to be accretive uh, in earnings, significantly accretive in earnings. And... Um, that is a fit for us so that we can expand sales opportunities and uh, they can expand sales opportunities. So uh, we're, we're focusing on someone in the same uh, sector, which is grab and go take home meals, which is growing very rapidly. 
in the supermarket. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I know in general that industry of of you know quick quick and easy food that people can purchase at grocery stores and other places, as you mentioned, HelloFresh is something that's just been taken off the past couple of years. Right. But uh, uh, people want high quality in that section. And if the price is fair, um, you know, you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, so just to finish the last question. So we think we can uh, make, make a, a reasonable acquisition with uh, lending. We're paying around three and a half percent right now. Um, so if you do the math, uh, we're looking at companies at uh, five to eight, eight times EBITDA purchase price. Uh, so uh, if, you know, it should be immediately accretive and then any benefits of uh, putting the two businesses together. Also, uh, if any of the companies that we're looking at, if they have manufacturing capabilities for some of our products or we have capabilities for theirs, there's additional uh, uh, benefits. Got it. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up EBITDA because my next question was going to be about the earnings. Um, so I saw the company, you know, match the analyst consensus estimate for earnings per share and right. then beat the beat the analyst consensus estimate for um, quarterly sales, which was came in at just above 12 million. Right. Uh, do you, do you want to speak on the, on these earnings reports at all? Sure. Um, well, the analyst uh, uh, saw what was happening uh, right now in the industry, very high uh, uh, cost of commodity costs and also very high shipping and packaging. So we're passing those costs on as price increases, but there's a lag. So uh, it takes a while to normalize. Also, we think that some of the uh, price increases, especially in um, freight and to a, a moderate extent in the commodities will, will back off. So not only will we uh, make our regular margin, we should make uh, a little, every time there's a major uh, event like this, our margins increase. So um, in the long run, you know, it's very, very positive for the company. Sales outlook is very positive. Um, some of the drivers which we've announced is um, placement of uh, pasta bowls at Albertson Safeway. They have about 2,200 locations. We're in the process of uh, going division to division. They've authorized 14, 14 items. Uh, the divisions are taking anywhere from six to 10. And thus far, uh, the rollout started in uh, July, small, and now we're moving into more divisions. Thus far, the results have been very, very positive. Um, also, pasta bowls uh, have done very, very well with Publix. Uh, I mentioned in my uh, uh, comments, um, quarterly comments, that Publix, we think Publix will become our number one customer. They have, uh, they've grown from 1,100 to 1,300 stores. Uh, they're um, growing um, their uh, green stores, which are similar to um, Whole Foods. They should have in two or three years, 100. So they should be at up to 14, 1500 stores um, in the next uh, five years. So they're very growing. They're a growing business. They've been a good customer. Um, some of the items we had in there were in um, voluntary distribution. In other words, a store manager could decide whether they wanted to have it in or not, unless there was a promotion. Uh, right now, we're in the planogram for the items, which probably will increase that business 30, 40%. So we're very, very optimistic. We have, uh, we sell Whole Foods National, we sell Sam's Club, a uh, uh, number of items. Uh, we're in, a, we just started a small distribution in Walmart, um, so uh, Costco, uh, we're, we were in one division, we're now in two. We're hopeful that by the end of the year, we'll be in three or four, that's on a ro rotation basis. So our business is uh, um, very positive in terms of sales and very positive in the long run in terms of margins. Yeah, I mean, that, that's very impressive, Carl. I'm excited to kind of watch this company, see how y'all are able to grow as, as you talked about these distributors continue to expand. Um, I guess my last question for you is, we all know what meatballs are. We all know what pasta is. Can you just explain the, the premise of a pasta ball real quick? Sure. Uh, the beauty of our product is we ship it in uh, frozen, as I mentioned. Uh, that shelf life is a year. And uh, as much as people like to say there's perfect logistics, they're not. So um, 
So a chain will order sometimes four times the amount that they normally do, and sometimes they order nothing. So, and that means their inventory control is uh, not as careful or uh, accurate as they'd like to think. So the product being frozen keeps it uh, fresh. And then at the store, they slack it out, they defrost it in the refrigerator, uh, normally 24 hours. Uh, it's done, at that point it has 30, at least 30 days shelf life in the bag. Um, that we, the case has 16. So they um, take out, uh, there's four, the subunits of four. So they take out four, usually four or eight, uh, cut the bags, and then layer, in some cases, sauce, pasta, protein, uh, cheese. So what you have at the store level, which has a three-day life typically, is a very fresh product, and it's not thoroughly mixed. And by not being thoroughly mixed, it's not soggy. So sometimes you go into a supermarket and you do a grab and go, uh, pasta grab and go, or other grab and goes. It's, fre it's fresh, uh, but it has, um, it's soggy. The flavors all come together and you have a meld and it's not crisp. So our business in that item in Publix right now is about five times what it was last year. Wow. When we introduced it. And that's based on taste. That was taste. Got so, it. Well, so Carl, it's thank a great you. yeah, I mean, it's very interesting, guys. And, and again, this ticker is MMMB, trading on the NASDAQ. If you want to go check it out, I have the stock chart pulled up. Looks like it's trading at about $2.68 right now. Um, let me know in the chat if you're going to add this to your watch list. Thank you, Carl, for, for taking time out of your busy Friday to join us on the Power Hour. Sounds like they're making some uh, pasta balls right behind you somewhere. <laughs> Uh, you're right. I have one last thing. On our website, we have um, an address if anybody would like some coupons, to try, uh, VIP coupons to try our product. Uh, just uh, send us, send me a note. It's on the website, uh, Carl at MamaMancinis.com. Got it. I'll drop that website in the chat, and then I'll, I'll throw your email in there as well, Carl at MamaMancini.com. All right, Carl, thank you again for joining us. Hope to have you on again soon. Anytime the company has news, let us know. We'll bring you on. I'm happy to talk about it. Love it. Thank you. All right. Enjoy your weekend. Bye. All right, y'all. That was Carl Wolf, CEO of Mama Man City. Again, ticker MMMB, trading on the NASDAQ. Um, as I said earlier, we have a packed show today on the Power Hour. So we're going to go ahead and get straight into our next interview. That is going to be with CEO of Pond Technologies, Grant Smith. If he gives me the universal sign, maybe a thumbs up that he's ready to go, go ahead and bring him on. Grant, how's it going? Great. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks for taking time out of your Friday to, uh, to join us on the Benzinga Power Hour. You bet. Um, let me get the chart pulled up real quick here. So Pond Technologies, ticker PNDHF. This is trading on the over-the-counter markets. Um, th this company is based in Canada, correct? Correct. Just outside of Toronto. Yeah. Uh, not too far from us. We're in Detroit, Michigan. Not too far. Um, so uh, real quick, Grant, for, for those in our audience that may not be familiar with Pond Technologies, do you mind just giving us a brief overview rundown of the company? Sure. Yeah. It's... Uh, it's about a 10 year old company. There's been 10 years of technology development. And in the last several years, we've made some significant advancements. Where we are now is we have a patented process that takes CO2 from say a large emitter, a smokestack, could be a natural gas power plant, could be a cement factory, could be any type of heavy industry, oil and gas. And we take the CO2 and two tons of CO2 are used to grow one ton of algae and algae you know, typically is what you would think is sort of bad. It's in your swimming pool. It's actually a building block of life. And we have many different applications and uses for algae. So that's sort of the, the quick synopsis. Got it. Yeah. And, and I do understand, Grant, that we had some news come out, um, not yesterday, but the day before. So I guess that makes it Wednesday. Um, yes. Do you want to give us a brief overview of that news? Sure. Yeah. We've actually worked on this deal with a very large global animal feed company. They're based in the UK. 
Uh, they're a division of Associated British Foods, which is a very large multinational company with operations uh, around the world. They're top 20 global animal, animal feed and fish feed uh, producer, and they sell you know, feed to, to animals in terms of livestock operations, cattle, pigs, chickens, and obviously various fish farms around the globe. They had the opportunity for the last year or so to look at various types of technology and various sources of alternative protein, and they chose algae. And then once they nailed down that they wanted to work with algae, they chose Pond Technologies. So what the, uh, the big picture plan is, they have uh, many operations around the world. They want to tap our technology into their CO2 source. So let's say they have a sugar factory or a, uh, you know, a food plant. We would take maybe 40,000 tons of CO2 and grow 20,000 tons of algae at one location. That algae is then further extracted. It can be uh, basically, give you an idea here, one of my friends said, yeah, show sure, this is a, a green algae. We can dry that into powder. We can put that into applications. And a lot of universities are doing work around the world, which sort of led to algae being a viable source of protein. Think of it as, you know, controlled vertical farming, lights, water, and CO2 coming into a container, a vessel that can vary in size, and we can grow a lot of algae. So what do we do with that algae? That's where uh, AB Agri, our new partner, validated the tech, and they have a use for, you know, we think in the future, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons of algae that'll be put into animal and fish feed at an inclusion rate of two to three percent. So the host facility, they get the carbon credits. So they get the, you know, they get the validation that they're a sustainable company. They get the carbon credits. We help them take that algae. We put it into solution, goes into their feed and uh, into the animals. And the really neat thing is you're actually reducing arable land farming. So if you're reducing two to three percent of an animal's diet of corn and soy because you've added spirulina, as an example, it's an algae that contains 60 percent protein. Wouldn't you know it, the animals are starting to grow fuller and faster. So it's a better source of feed for the animals. And uh, we're also finding that there's certain types of algae that are needed for certain animals like uh, fish would be salmon. If salmon don't get the right type of algae in their diet that they naturally get in the ocean, the salmon, farm salmon would be white. So astaxanthin is an example of a red algae that we currently grow now, at one of our facilities in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And that is needed in the animal's diet, or in this case, in the salmon's diet. So we really, you know, we've really been pleased with this partnership. We feel it has a lot of legs. It's a very uh, great model. We get a tech access fee, a license fee up front. We make engineering services in terms of selling equipment and helping them build the facility and then Pond Tech gets a royalty on the back end. So it's a great model for us, and it's as I mentioned, I just can't stress enough, it's a really great validator of the tech. Yeah, and I, I know, you know, you mentioned astaxanthin. I know that's a good antioxidant for humans as well. Correct, yes. We, in our, in our human-grade plant in Vancouver, Canada, we actually grow that, that red algae, and it is an antioxidant. We're actually finding astaxanthin now in facial uh, skin cream, so cosmetics, or uh, there's an area called cosmeceutical. It's obviously in human-grade. It's used in a lot of recovery joint products. It actually helps reverse inflammation inside the cell or inside the joint if you had bad knees. So we have a growing market as a customer base, so if you think of major US CPG companies and global CPG companies, they're all putting astaxanthin into their formulations. Another uh, really interesting product that comes out of spirulina, it's often called blue-green algae. I just thought for the, for the users, here's an example of you know, the blue color that can be extracted out of the green algae. So what you're finding here is it's often called blue-green algae because you can extract different ingredients out of that algae and they have a larger, uh, what I would call, you know, area of interest for consumer-based companies and the fact that everyone's moving to natural. So a natural blue color coming out of spirulina is very, very uh, of interest to large companies that want to get away from the artificial color. So just think beverage companies, confection, obviously come to mind. Uh, so there's a lot of areas. Also within ingredients like algae, spirulina, you can extract other things like omega-3 oils so I love this analogy. I don't know if anyone out there has watched Sea Spiracy and Cowspiracy, these sort of shows on Netflix that are waking up the population to what's actually happening and how we're over farming, too much arable land farming, we're overfishing the oceans. Within algae, 
using our technology, we can actually grow the algae to contain a fatter amount of, say, oil, EPA, is echo sale from toic acid. A lot of people might be familiar with DHA, sort of a cousin to DHA. It's used in a lot of supplements. We can skip the fishing stage. We can just grow algae. It's also vegetarian. It's, uh, it's grown using a CO2 abatement platform. And then we sell that algae as an oil and it's put into a soft gel, let's say a, you know, a pharmaceutical heart health type product. Wow. Yeah, that's fascinating how many different uses um, for the products there are. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned sea spiracy, you know, thing, things of that nature, because I think um, for most people, when they think of environmental damage caused by farming, a lot of people point to, um, you know, cattle, cows and the CO2 emitted from them. But why do you think it's important to, I guess, try to progress the, the fish farming practices um, to a more environmental, environmental friendly way? Well, currently, you know, I think it's, you know, the real summary is we're, we're running out of feed and food for the planet. So you're seeing more and more vertical farms and, you know, you're seeing micro uh, lettuce and things like that in vertical farms. Our operation is a little greater in the fact that, you know, we can abate significant amounts of CO2. And from that CO2 at a two to one ratio, we can grow tons and tons of algae. So back to your question, if you're looking at something like, uh, you know, a, a chicken plant or, or just a livestock operation, you can take all the parts of the animal that typically just be, gets incinerated, doesn't go to landfill, it's just incinerated, turns into CO2. We grab that CO2 and grow algae and feed it back to the animals. So then you're kind of getting that closed loop. And again, you've reduced arable land farming because we cannot continue to farm, cut down the rainforest in Brazil. I'd rather tap into 35 cement factories in Brazil reduce their CO2, grow algae, and feed that algae to the animals. And then they don't have to you know, farm as much. So that's sort of that picture. And on the fish feed, same thing, Norway, Scotland, Chile, a lot of these areas, fully developed areas with tons of natural CO2 from you know, natural gas power plants, et cetera. We can tap into that source of CO2, grow tons and tons of algae, and, and grow specific strains of algae that are needed for certain species. As I mentioned, astaxanthin for salmon, you know, for shrimp and then different types of algae for other types of fish. Got it. Yeah, that, that's, that's incredible, Grant. Um, real quick in the chat, NCAL's asking about any major partnerships. So I know we, we talked about the um, one with British Foods, but on the human grade side, any major partnerships with vitamin companies, cosmetics, uh, food companies, anything like that? Sure. I, I'd say, you know, I can't talk to any specifics. We're in talks. And I think what's interesting to note for Pond Technologies, I've been involved with the company for four years. And I'd say in the last year, our phone's been ringing off the hook. So now we're getting the supplement companies, you know, we're getting the major CPGs. And the concern is global shipping. I think our, your last guest, Carl, he mentioned that in some of the challenges and just moving product around the world and so on and so forth. Picture it this way, if you had a massive operation in Texas and you didn't want to bring in product from Southeast Asia, we could grow that, that algae right in, right in, right in uh, Texas. And then you, you've reduced shipping, you've reduced lead times, you've reduced, reduced your carbon footprint. So our operations are basically very easy. We just need light, water, you know, access to water, access to power, and we put our system beside a production facility. So I think that's something neat. And I'd love to talk to Carl about putting some spirulina in his meatballs. So you yeah. know, we're getting ve we're getting vegetarian companies, you know, meat alternatives, if you want to sort of generically call it that, because that, that encompasses, the, you know, the sausage, the, the meatballs and everything, all the patties and that, that market. Uh, spirulina, chlorella, other sources of vegetarian protein, they are algae and they are up to 66% protein with a perfect amino acid profile tons of vitamins and minerals. So it's really the perfect superfood. And I mean, this is an example, you mentioned supplement companies. So that's just a, a spirulina greens drink that I, that I take daily. And, um, you know, I'm really 85. So it makes me, uh, keeps me young. <laughs> uh, that's good, Grant. Um, he's not actually 85 guys, but no, um, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, the, the spirulina. Yeah. I actually worked at a, like a vegan juice bar for a while and I was fascinated at how many people coming in were opting to add spirulina to, to their drinks as an add-on. So I went out and kind of like researched on my own, like what are all the benefits? And that was what was maybe most surprising to me was how um, like protein packed it really is. 
Yes. Well, my my undergrad is a Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition. So early days, you know, we were sort of pioneering these new superfoods or nutraceuticals. And, you know, if you go back to, you know, 30, even 40 years ago, that industry didn't really exist to the extent that it exists now. And there's a huge market for movement to natural, reduction of artificial colors. Again, there's a, a really nice, beautiful blue color that comes from algae. We don't have to use an artificial blue dye that could have contraindications on, you know, ADHD in children, maybe cancer. You know, there's a lot of early studies that are linking all these sort of processed foods and artificial ingredients that we use predominantly every day. We don't even realize it. So your juice bar, that's you, you, you saw it, right? People wanting clean, natural. And the fact with Pontech, we've got a sustainability model behind how we roll the algae, which we think has got, you know, that that's part of the solution to help the planet going forward. Yeah. And actually at the juice bar, we did have some fun blue spirulina that we were able to make some fun, like yeah. blue juices with that sold really well. Cause who doesn't want, you know, a, a tasty, yeah. cool looking blue drink. Um, the other thing that we also sold a lot of was wheatgrass juice. Yes. Yeah. And that's, so that's, that's not typically, necessarily an algae, but it yeah. does also have a lot of health benefits. Yeah, it's blended. Yeah. It's part of that whole movement. Right. So, yeah. And, and, you know, in summary, it's a, it's really a super food and it, we're showing the results are showing up rather as, you know, in chickens, as an example, they're growing fuller and faster by having, you know, a one to two to 3% inclusion in their diet. So we really think this is, this is, you know, the, the AB Agri partnership is really big. There's a prior partnership that we, we actually press released a few weeks ago. It was with an unnamed major oil and gas company. And they, they hit us up around a year ago to see if we could grow COVID SARS spike two proteins in, in algae. So there was some work done at a local university outside of Toronto. We were given the proteins to grow. And sure enough, it took us a couple of months, but now at, at a scalable system, we can grow these, these antigens, if you will. And basically the proteins can be used in detection. And what this has spawned is a new division. We've, we've got the domain pondbiotech.com. So this is a sort of a startup, you know, version within, within Pond Tech. And we are looking at the entire vaccine, uh, you know, medical diagnostic and therapeutic industry that grow proteins in Chinese hamster ovary cells, you know, Cho cells, very difficult, invasive, costly, and in water, light, CO2, and just like a five gallon container, we can grow these proteins. And some of them sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars a kilo. So this is a whole new industry that we've just sort of stumbled across. I wanted to make sure we also mentioned that press release that was about two weeks ago. Wow, yeah, and uh, guys, I'll link those press releases in the chat. Um, but Grant, we are running out of time here, but I wanna thank you for coming on the Benzinga Power Hour today. We'd love to have you back on, you know, anytime the company has news or any updates that you like to talk about. Um, I find it very fascinating and I'm sure some of our audience does as well. And, and I'd be happy to make that intro to you, to, to Carl, to talk about some of those, uh, you know, vegan meatball sure. opportunities. Well, great. Thanks for having me. We're always available. We'd, we'd love to come back on. Of course. All right, Grant. Enjoy your weekend. And, uh, you know, hope, hope Canada is doing well with, with COVID and everything. Thank you. Stay safe. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, y'all. That was Grant Smith, CEO of Pond Technologies. I love talking about, you know, talking about some superfoods. As I said, I had some experience working in a, in a vegan juice bar for my mama. So that was fun. Um, but yeah, let me know in the chat what you think about Pond Technologies as well as Mama Cena, the last two public companies we had on the show today. Uh, but real quick, we're going to play a quick video before it get technical. Um, a little like intern summer send off video. It's pretty funny. So this video should redirect you to that video and that video should redirect you to get technical. So we got kind of a crazy day going on the Benzig YouTube on Friday, but hope you all will stick around with us um, going over to that video now. Check it out. Summer intern. Funny video.